Indigenous peoples of Colombia began on Tuesday the fourth summit of the Colombian indigenous movement in the ancestral territory of Guachucal. In the United Kingdom, a British court issued an extradition order against journalist WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States. And on Tuesday in Sri Lanka, at least one person was killed and 24 others were injured during a crackdown on demonstrators protesting against the severe economic crisis in the country. Police responded to stone throwing with live fire. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor, Diego Martin, from the Telser Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. Indigenous peoples of Colombia began on Tuesday the fourth summit of the Colombian indigenous movement in the ancestral territory of Guachucal. At the event, which wraps up on Wednesday, delegates from communities and organizations will be discussing the strengthening of indigenous governance and territorial autonomy and the strengthening of political, social, and popular dialogue with different social sectors. They will also discuss the challenges of the constitutional rights of indigenous peoples enshrined in the 1991 political charter, the strengthening of indigenous policy backed by international cooperation, cooperation and also the high and social popular dialogues with the 1991 political charter the strengthening of the policy backed by international cooperation, human rights, defense of life and the implementation of the peace agreement. And in Cuba, an emotive commemorative gala was held in Havana in the midst of another anniversary of the triumph of Playa Giron. The Covarrubias Hall of Cuba's National Theater hosted the artistic event that commemorated the 61st anniversary of Cuba's triumph over the hostilities of the United States. The artistic cultural program was attended by Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel Bermudez and by other high government officials and by prominent Cuban artists. The act was laden with historical references, historical reference, including an audiovisual material making reference to Cuban Revolution historic leader Fidel Castro and music performed by the National Concert Band. There was also poetry recited by Cuban youths. The program included the screening of the documentary. Giron by Manuel Herrera and the presentation of the book Playa Giron, Victoria de Pueblos, Giron, a victory of the peoples. On Wednesday, former Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez would be taken to the United States to where he has been extradited for alleged drug trafficking charges. On Wednesday, amid a police operation, preparations are being made to comply with the extradition of former President Hernandez. At the Special Forces headquarters where Orlando Hernandez is being held, there are armed vehicles, police and patrols, and there are helicopters hovering the area. The authorities are handling the extradition of Hernandez with secrecy for security reasons. However, it is expected that by midday, Honduran police will hold a press conference to give details about the process. In Brazil, President Jair Bolsonaro revealed that the army intervened in the impeachment of former President Dilma Rousseff in 2016. The president reviewed the role of the armed forces during a ceremony to commemorate the Brazilian Army Day and once again vindicated the 1964 coup d'etat. In this context, Bolsonaro said that during the political crisis of 2016, the intervention General Eduardo Villas Boas led to the impeachment of former President Dilma Rousseff and the arrival of Michel Temer to power in 2018. When he was head of the army, Villas Boas made threats to the Supreme Court when it was considering the release of former President Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. And former Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva announced that on May 7th he will be launching his pre-candidacy for the presidency of the Workers' Party. Lula da Silva said that after launching his presidential pre-candidacy, he plans to travel across Brazil to interact with the people. He is also committed to a dialogue with the indigenous population to revert the expropriation policy promoted by the current administration. The leader of the Workers' Party said that the country needs peace in order to seriously discuss such issues as development and employment. The former president said that the October elections will show the degree of polarization in the country, despite the fact that polls indicate that Lula da Silva has a 43.3% voting intention. In Panama, the visit of the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who traveled to this country amid tight security measures to attend a regional meeting on migration, was rejected by popular movements such as the National Front in Defense of Economic and Social Rights. 
The presence of Blinken and the Secretary of National Security, Alejandro Mayorkas of the United States, arrived in an avant-garde delegation and it's been condemned by popular movements such as the National Front in Defense of Economic and Social Rights, known as Frena Deso, which announced a demonstration on Tuesday at the monument in honor to the fallen in the deed of January 9, 1964 in Panama to protest against the arrival of the emissaries of war. Blinken arrived in the Isthmus at the head of the high-level delegation to attend a two-day ministerial conference on migration. The Association of Journalists of El Salvador presented before the Supreme Court of Justice an appeal of unconstitutionality regarding the reforms to the criminal code and the gang prohibition law. According to the organization, the modifications to these regulations violate freedom of expression and the Salvadoran people's right to information. Similarly, the Cristosal Foundation pointed out that the reform package punishes with up to 15 years in prison any manifestation that alludes to the territorial control of the gangs. Also, representatives of both organizations announced that four journalists left the country over fear of being detained. The Spanish government said it will drop a requirement to wear face masks indoors except in hospitals and on public transport from April 20th due to declining COVID-19 infections. Health Minister Carolina Darias announced the measure during a cabinet meeting with regional health officials in the city of Toledo near Madrid. Testing now focuses on vulnerable people such as those over 60, caregivers, pregnant women and people who are immunodepressed. Spain has one of the world's highest COVID-19 vaccination rates with 92.4% of the population over the age of 12 fully immunized against the virus. The country so far recorded more than 100,000 deaths from COVID-19. In addition to this very high vaccination coverage, which has been changing the characteristics of the evolution of the pandemic, all the main indicators for monitoring the pandemic are at a low risk level in most of the country. And what's more, something that seems key to us is that the severity of the disease has decreased significantly, mainly as a result of the positive impact of the vaccines in our lives. China reported seven new deaths from COVID-19 in Shanghai, raising the toll in the metropolis during a weeks-long lockdown. City health authorities revealed the first virus deaths on Monday, with Tuesday's fatalities bringing the total official toll to just 10, despite the scale of the outbreak. Beijing insists its zero-COVID policy of hard lockdowns, mass testing, and lengthy quarantines averted fatalities and the public health crises that engulfed much of the rest of the world. It also reported more than 20,000 new COVID cases, the vast majority who are asymptomatic. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In the United Kingdom, a British court issued a an order against journalist WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States. Westminster's Magistrates Court in London issued a formal request to the UK's Interior Minister Priti Patel to proceed with the extradition of Assange. According to experts, the cyber activist's defense team can still resort to the last appeals of the case. The Australian activist and journalist risks 175 years in prison in the United States for disseminating secret Pentagon files which exposed war crimes committed in Iraq and Afghanistan by the invading army. On Wednesday, dozens of Assange supporters gathered outside the magistrate's court to demand his immediate release. We are coming to the end of this long legal battle, where the danger of extradition is more and more imminent and where all of us, we must redouble our rejection of this persecution and our solidarity towards a journalist who is criminalized for telling the truth, a precedent that endangers all journalists in the world. On the extradition of a journalist and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the United States, his spouse Stella Morris said the following. The UK has no obligation to extradite Julian Assange to the United States. In fact, it is required by its international obligations 
to stop this extradition. Boris Johnson and Priti Patel don't extradite Julian to the country that conspired to murder him. Boris Johnson and Priti Patel can stop this at any time. They can stop it today. They can stop this nightmare today and return Julian to his family. They can do the right thing and enforce Article 4 of the US-UK Extradition Treaty, which prohibits extraditions for political offenses. Right now, they're in breach of their own treaty. Also addressing the new developments in the case of Julian Assange, the Bureau Director for Reporters Without Borders in the United Kingdom, Rebecca Vincent, to face the media and supporters of the Australian activists, demanding to put more pressure on the British institutions involved in the case. This has always been a political case, but as Stella says, this is now 100% again a political decision of the UK government. We have about a four-week window to attempt to influence the Home Secretary. Now, we can't undo the more than decade of persecution and the suffering that Julian Assange has faced simply for his contributions for journalism, for publishing information in the public interest. That can't be undone. But what we can still influence is what happens next. It is not too late for the UK government to now do the right thing, to act to protect journalism, to protect press freedom, to adhere to their own international obligations and their own stated commitment to champion media freedom globally. That cannot be done with Julian Assange sitting in Belmarsh prison where he never should have spent a single day. The Russian government delivered on Wednesday a peace agreement proposal to Ukraine seeking to end the conflict in the Donbass region. In a press conference, the Kremlin's spokesman Dmitry Peshkov said the initiative contains clear and well-explained proposals. The officials said that they are waiting for a response from Kyiv. Peskov said that the Ukrainian executive is constantly changing his positions and statements, a situation which hinders progress in the negotiations. According to Moscow, this policy is part of a strategy by the United States to delay the talks between the two parties. Among the security demands made by Russia are the non-expansion of NATO into Eastern Europe and that Ukraine remain neutral. Russia's Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu accused the United States and its allies of supplying Ukraine with weapons so that it continues fighting until the last Ukrainian stands. The official said at a defense briefing that Washington and other Western nations are doing all they can do to drag out Russia's special military operation in Ukraine. Shoigu said that the Russian military implemented the plan to fully liberate the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics after eight years of fighting against Kyiv security forces. The Russian army is fulfilling the task set by the commander-in-chief in the course of the special military operation. The plan to fully liberate the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic is being consistently implemented and measures are being taken to establish a peaceful life. The Russian servicemen participating in the operation show courage and heroism in the fulfillment of their military duty. We have more news coming up after one final short break. Please stay with us. Hi and welcome back. On Tuesday in Sri Lanka, at least one person was killed and 24 others resulted injured during a crackdown on demonstrators protesting against a severe economic crisis in the country. Police responded to stone throwing with live fire. Clashes broke out in Rambukana, Kigali Central District, when groups of demonstrators blocked railway tracks in protest against the latest record fuel price hike in force since midnight on Monday. Police spokesman Nihal Thaldu was said that security forces warned the protesters to scatter, but they did not listen and continued with violence, forcing them to respond. Meanwhile, Kigali Hospital Director Mahiri Priyangani said that at least one person was killed and 10 injured, while another doctor at Kigali Hospital put the number of injured at 24, including eight policemen. The morning protest was very calm and quiet. Around noon, the crowd got bigger. At the time, two old trucks had arrived. Because of the crowd, they could not enter the gas station. The police used tear gas in an attempt to disperse the protesters. 
When the protesters were tear gassed, they responded by throwing stones. Then the police started shooting. At least 10 people died in Malaysia after a mass jailbreak started early Wednesday morning at an immigration detention center in the east of the country. According to the Malaysian Immigration Department, at 4.30 a.m. local time, a protest by hundreds of Rohingya minority inmates began at the Relao Immigration Center in the western state of Kedah, resulting in a riot and the escape of 528 people. According to the authorities, 362 of the escapees were captured, while the search continues for the rest. The department does not report any possible fatalities in its state. Statement. While the Star newspaper quotes internal sources to confirm the death of 10 escapees apparently run over during the chaotic exit from the immigration center. The relatively prosperous Malaysia has been for years one of the preferred destinations of the Rohingya as a stateless ethnic minority from Myanmar. Nobel Peace Prize laureate and one of the leaders of the East Timorese Independence, Jose Ramos Orta leads the presidential election vote count with more than 50 percent of the votes counted. Ramos Orta obtained 59.36 percent of the ballots, while incumbent President Francisco Luolo Guterres obtained 40.64 percent, according to electoral authorities. So far, 459,665 votes have been counted, out of a total of 859,925 cast during the elections held on Tuesday. Ramos Horta, who has returned to the political front line at the age of 77, survived an assassination attempt in 2008, was foreign minister from 2002 to 2006, head of government from 2006 to 2007, and president from 2007 to 2012, and was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1996 for his work in for the Timorese resistance abroad in the face of brutal Indonesian occupation. The Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs denounced as war crimes the bombings perpetrated by the United States and its allies against several cities in the nation. The Foreign Ministry denounced in a document addressed to the United Nations that the destruction of the city of al Raqqa and the killing of thousands of civilians by the illegal alliance formed by Washington did not receive the due international attention. The authorities in Damascus demanded the multilateral institution to analyze the acts of the White House and hold the United States accountable for the atrocities committed against the Syrian population. In June 2017, Washington bombarded al Raqqa with the excuse of fighting terrorist groups. U.S. troops are also operating illegally in the country without the authorization of the executive in Damascus, which accuses Western powers of financing terrorist groups in Syria. The Prime Minister of the Solomon Islands, Manasseh Sogavare, confirmed Wednesday the signing of a security pact with China. To announce that the Solomon Islands Foreign Minister, the Honorable Jeremiah Manelli, has signed the security cooperation framework with his People's Republic of China counterpart, State Council, and Foreign Minister Wang Wanghe a few days ago. Meanwhile, Sogavara said that the agreement is not aimed at third countries but focuses on internal security. The clarification comes amidst repudiating statements made by the United States and Austra Australia. The Solomon Islands do not have any external adversaries, nor is the framework directed at any countries or external alliance, alliances, rather at our own internal security situation from within the state. It complements our 2017 security agreement with Australia. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstra English. You can also join us on social media for all the latest news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telstra English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.